It's the 1930s, you're incredibly rich, and you've come to Scarborough for Britain's biggest fish. Where would you stay? The Grand Hotel. The record tunny, or bluefin tuna, was £851. Errol Flynn, David Niven, Lord Rothschild, they were here to join the tunny club. They were the sportsmen. Let's go meet the fishermen. Bill Pashby, pictured here, fourth from the left, was boat boy for a millionaire industrialist called H.E. Weatherly, pictured on the far left. Now in his 80s, in the pub with Scarborough skipper and author Fred Normandale, Bill recalls the day this photo was taken, the single most successful day's tunny fishing ever recorded, when four fish were caught to one rod, weighing 545 pounds, 589 pounds, 714 pounds and 743 pounds. He caught four fish before breakfast and this particular time I was aboard the big boat and after the fourth fish I helped him out. You could see he was tired and uh, I said Mr Weatherly the fish are still around us. He looked up at me and said impetuous youth. Because <laughs> yeah. our job when they were in the boat was to keep throwing herrings overboard to keep them around us. But he did catch four before breakfast. Did you used to buy your herrings from the drifters? Yes, we give them a crate of beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do. You've got your, your lord on the boat. It had to be a little boat, didn't it? That was the rules. That was the rules. Rowing boat. Of the time club. Why, why was that? That was the Tony Club rules. It had to be caught in a small open boat. Because it was boat. more sporting. Mm. Yes, sport. That was, their, that was their thing. Yeah. OK, and so they've, they've got their, their herring with the hooks right over the side. and. A tunny takes it. What do they do next? Well, <coughs> let so much line out and then he's back. And then <coughs> the guy on the oars is pulling like to, to, to put more weight on the fish. That's you? Yes. That was my job on the oars. And you were uh, 12 years old? No, I was uh, no, I was 15 then, left school. So 15 years old with a possible 800 pound fish pulling against you. Yeah, that's what you had to do, keep pulling. <laughs> to eventually, when it's going that fast, you had to lift the oars in and you were really going, really going. And when you say that fast, that's I mean three knots? Yeah, you'd know, be doing about four or five. And then took it sleigh ride. Yeah. <laughs> Ikey Price was another boat boy for a rival boat. You'd, you'd see the tunny fish come to the surface, you could see them. I mean, I mean, there was some. I'm not talking, you didn't just see three or four fish. Maybe see twenty or thirty fish milling about, and what were they? And they were after the the herring that you were after the herring, yeah. What sort of size were these fish? What the tunny fish? Yeah. Well, they're all all the weights are on them there. Five hundred pounders, six hundred so, pounders. We have him sat aft in the boat with his rod ready, and we'd have some herrings there. And when we saw the tunnies come to the surface. The oak would be baited and it would be paired away. And then one of the tunnies would, oh, we're open, and one would come up and take the hook. And then it would tow us till it died, till we killed it. You, you, you made them drown themselves. You see, then it came to the surface and laid on the surface. Tunny Club's centre of operations was off the Yorkshire fishing ports of Whitby, Scarborough and Bridlington. Stalker and big game hunter Peter Carr is well known to us as editor of Sporting Rifle magazine. He was brought up in Bridlington at the heart of the fishing industry. He takes us to Flamborough Head. From 8 to 10 miles off to 50 miles was where the tunny was depending on where the herring shells were at the time. The herring drifters, the skippers would come down from Scotland and follow the herring shells down and they would report when the tunny were around the boat, which were, they were actually picking up the fallen herrings that were dropping out of the drift nets. And then the uh, sportsmen would come out from Scarborough and from Whitby, towing the rowing boats behind. And uh, the gentry then, uh, and la later on, you know, some famous film stars came in pursuit of the tunny. The Tunny Club headquarters is now a fish and chip shop and a shrine for a tunny tourist such as me. I chat to the owner and a regular about the draw of this extraordinary fish. This is, it, well, if you were playing golf, this would be a 19th hole. Yeah. Yeah. This is where they come in, <laughs> yes. settle down, talk about how they caught, how 
And the one that got the away. Way. One that got away, you know. Um, there, were f there was uh, John Wayne, Errol Flynn, David Niven, Charles Lawton, and his brother Thomas. Because Thomas was got which Charles was going one boat, he was going another. Um, Baron Rothschild. And then you had money people of England that used to come up and have a go. They were going to take the fireplace out and we asked for it to be left in because it gives you a place character. You, you'd, you'd have lost your tunny club if you didn't take the fireplace So this is the out. fireplace that the tunny club had? This, yes. Pete and his pal Ben Wolford take me out of Scarborough in a modern commercial fishing boat to try out the old-fashioned tackle. In the days of the Tunny Club, this would have been done at night with a skiff launched from the mothership, rowed by boys such as Bill and Ikey. Ben shows me how to set up the old rod, reel, line and bait, just as Bill and Ikey would have done for the great sportsmen and women of that golden age of fishing. Straight through the eye. Through the stomach. What? It's sometimes just a bit soft though, aren't they, Owen? So. Yeah. That's it. Will do. There goes the reel. <laughs> Good old Scarborough reel. So what's a what's a special about a Scarborough reel? Well, not really. It's just what they had back then. They, they, like nowadays, they have the multipliers. I don't know if you've seen them. Yeah. The old cogs and yeah. raw reductions on them. And it, they're just a simple way out. Really. That is an enormous reel, isn't it? This, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get bigger ones than that, you'll get, well, you get some real big ones. As, as the boat drifts, you just let line away, steady away. I ain't seen Tony no, but it's got to be some, are not they? I don't know. Of course we don't get a tunny, and to add to the insult, the seagulls take our bait. Well, we're here at the Scarborough Museum Trust at Wood End, and uh, my lovely assistant here is uh, going to tell us from the basement of the museum exactly what he's holding. Peter, you took us out yesterday in the boat. What have you got in your hand here? Well, this is actually an original uh, tunny rod, a uh, boat rod, with the roller at the end, the Scarborough wheel, with spun hemp twine, original, all original, and the original harness, uh, which was actually worn by Mitchell Henry, who's in the Tunny Record book. Uh, it looks like it weighs an absolute ton. Is that, is, is that to hold it all together? Yeah, you would actually be sat on the thoft, which is the nautical term for a flat seat on a, on a skiff or a rowing boat. And there would be a hole for, for putting in the, the, the butt of the rod. And this would, the harness would just take the weight off the fish when you, as the actual tunny would be t towing the skiff or the rowing boat. Towing the skiff? Yeah, it would, yeah. For half an hour at a time we learned, didn't we? Yeah, half an hour up to an hour, yeah. Now, we can't ignore the fact that in the background there is a very large fish. Um, is this the uh, sort of thing they were after? That's it, exactly what they were after. And this one was 852 pounds. There's a one pound in it, but it's the, recon the recognised record, I believe, is 851 pounds. Put that many powerful men and women in a room no bigger than a fish and chip shop and you're going to get arguments. In 1949, John Headley Lewis caught the 852 pound fish whose cast is in the Scarborough Museum. Lorenzo Mitchell Henry, whose 851 pounder from 1933 was the record holder, successfully contested Headley Lewis's claim with Tunny Club officials. He maintained that the rope Headley Lewis used to string up his fish was wet, so adding more than a pound to its weight. Others have since pointed out that Mitchell Henry's rope was thicker, so surely that should have made a difference. And, and we've got a lovely um, rod box here, and that was, who was that? R.T. Lawton, who's that? Who's that? That's a, a, a local hotelier, which is Charles Lawton's brother, the actor, famous actor from Scarborough. And, and uh, R.T. had hotels around here and his brother was off swanning around Hollywood and bringing in good customers, I guess. That's right. Good. Two bites at the apple. <laughs> and I've got a, um, ex an extremely nasty looking instrument here. What, what would I be using this for? That's actually the boat gaff. So when, when the tunny was brought alongside dead, they would gaff through here. Through oh, where? Actually on the tunny, under here. Under there? Yeah. And this would actually come up 
inside of the, the actual fish's mouth. Yeah. And that gives you a good purchase to keep it alongside while they can get the strop around the tail, pull the strop tight. That's a piece of leather around here. That's right. And block and tackle. And you swing pull the whole thing out. That's right, yeah. Is it still wriggling at this stage? No, it's dead. You've killed it. Yeah, right. it's dead, definitely dead. And you've got it and you've got it on board and you've got an awful lot of fish by the look of it. There's a lot of tins of tuna there. <laughs> Will the glory days of the Tunny Club ever come back? So. No, because I don't think you part of it is... Your health well, and safety would come health into it, Health and safety sure. would come into it. They would certainly wouldn't um, allow a little rowing boat, I don't think, out there. I think health and safety would come into it. But there again, I don't the think there's the characters like the ones mm. in them days. Do you think those days will ever come back? No. Why not? Wiped out. Never? Like the dinosaur, we're gone. The Tunny Club began in the 1930s. By the 1950s, it was all over. After decades of few Tunny sightings, sport fishermen in Donegal are now reporting big fish again. In 2001, two boats met 15 bluefin tuna and a new Irish and European record was set by Adrian Malloy, fishing with skipper Michael Callaghan, who caught this amazing fish of nine 168 pounds. The World Wildlife Fund has highlighted the plight of bluefin tuna stocks. Most of these sport fishermen are now on catch and release and providing vital data on tunny sightings. With bluefin now one of the most valuable fish in the world, unfortunately the commercial fishermen are not on catch and release.